whom the heavens must receive until the restoration of what? All things. To Israel were given the promises of the Messiah. No Gentile nation was ever given the promise of the Christ. They knew nothing about him. They knew nothing of the law of God. They knew nothing of God. They were totally heathen and pagan. They totally were given over to the worship of demons, never to the worship of God. And as a matter of fact, natural Israel most of the time was also given over to the worship of demons in the worship of their idols and their idolatrous rites. They were not worshipping the true God at all. So the promises of the Old Testament were so fulfilled in Jesus Christ that there's no promise left for anybody in any nation of Israel. As a matter of fact, at this time, there is no natural nation of Israel with Israelites in it. What's their Akazars? Do your research. Not one of them is a descendant of Abraham. Now think about this. If the promises were still to be for Israel, and they are not, let me emphasize that. There's no promises in the Old Testament to be fulfilled in any nation of Israel. I follow the usual beliefs without giving much emphasis on it. I was just looking for the return of the Lord. But I, I believed those things without being uh, an eager adherent or a close adherent, if you like, just call it that. Can I ask this? If there is to be an Israel on this earth, where are the ten tribes? Where are they? Where's the tribe of Gad? Where's the tribe of all the others? Here are the ten tribes of Israel. Genesis 49. Reuben, Simeon, Levi. Well, Judah. But that's the second, the first and the second of the nation of Judah. Zebulun, Issachar, Dan, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, and then of course is Benjamin. So I've mentioned the 12 tribes. Judah and Benjamin became the nation of Judah. They were still the nation of Israel, but they were called Judah. The nation of Israel with its 10 tribes did not exist. But the nation of Israel existed because the ten tribes had disappeared. Can anybody know, or tell me, where any descendant of any of those ten tribes is living today? No, you cannot. And where are the ten tribes? They don't exist. Now, the second thing is, where is the tribe of Judah? And where is the tribe of Benjamin? does not exist. And as a matter of fact, not only do those 12 tribes not exist, there is not one descendant from any of them. They were all assimilated by converting to other religions or having other re uh, heathen people convert to them, taking them in as proselytes through intermarriage. And we have mentioned before about that professor in Tel Aviv uh, University who linguistically has proved they do not exist. What is there in Israel today are two kinds of people, the Khazars and the Ethiopian blacks. Now the Khazars never were in relationship to any descendant of Israel until there were some Israelites who settled there around A.D. 700 and 800 
to convert the nation of Caesarea to Judaism that then was, not the Judaism of Moses. The Judaism that then was, was that which came out of Babylon, that had the Mishnah, the, uh, the Mishara, the Gemara, the Talmud, the Kabbalah. They had that orally and they had it in some writing. Now in relation to the black Ethiopians, they originally descended from Solomon. But of course, there's no white or red color amongst them today. They're pure black. The, what genes did exist from Solomon's son via uh, the Queen of Sheba were removed bit by bit as they intermarried with the blacks, Ethiopians. Now Ethiopia fascinates me. I was quite friendly with an Ethiopian young woman a while back. She's gone back to Ethiopia. But I have read about the Lost Ark <laughs> and tried to trace it uh, through archaeologists and so forth who've written books. And I was young and still and alive when the Lion of Judah called Selassie came to the throne in Ethiopia. Hail Selassie, he said, and called himself the Lion of Judah. And we had a, a, a man in our church who'd been a brethren and became baptized in the spirit. He was our neighbor. And he used to talk to me about this because he thought it was most unscriptural. And of course it is. So uh, there does not exist in this day any pure descendant from Abraham. Now I was read from age 14 in the Assemblies of God. Before that I was Elam Pentecostal and Independent Pentecostal. And so the Assemblies of God had a great influence, their beliefs, on my life. And we downloaded an Assemblies of God USA 1939 Pentecostal Evangel. Now I had never read that one. But some years later, after the war, I used to order the American Assemblies of God Pentecostal Evangel and read them all. Now in this particular one, this is what I noticed. And of course, I had noticed about USA Assemblies of God that they did like to talk about Israel. Well, in this evangel, it turns out Maya Perlman is a, a vice editor and I am sure Maya Perlman, don't get too horrified, was a plant amongst the Assemblies of God. I studied his book, but he never said a word in the book about Hegel's philosophy or quoted any Hebrew or said anything about a certain man who's a Jew and a Jewish Kabbalist, as I discovered on investigating the files of, uh, I forget what they call it, it's an Assembly of God site where they keep the records of, of their, uh, the be their beginnings. And of course they mention this. He quoted Hegel. Hegel is an evil philosopher. And Hegel is the one that Judaism follows today as in his philosophy. He quoted Babylonian Hebrew. And, and Perlman had in his library a thousand books. He was a scholar. He came up in his education through Judaism. He learned all about the Kabbalah. He learned all about the Talmud. He learned all about the Mishnah and the Gemara. He never said one thing about it 
in when he became an Assemblies of God teacher and leader. He kept that hidden. He was a plant. Well, in this magazine, it mentions quite freely, oh, the Jews. We were able to, advertise, uh, to evangelize Jews. They eagerly received our Gospels and so forth. But they talked about Israel, the Restoration, and they also talked about Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and the Antichrist. Well, looking at the Assemblies of God Australia, of which I was a member of Glad Tidings Tabernacle under Pastor W.A. Buchanan, a godly man, who became the editor of the Australian Pentecostal Evangel. I don't ever rem remember reading anything in those Australian Pentecostal Evangels that emphasised Israel or the Jews. And as my pastor, with me listening to him twice a week, Sunday morning and Sunday night, and uh, when we had a prayer meeting, I don't recollect he ever said anything about Israel because he did not come from the ranks of the Assemblies of God. He came into Pentecost from the Presbyterian Church that doesn't believe in the millennium and he came into Pentecost through Sister Lancaster of Melbourne, Good News Mission, a well-known Australian Pentecostal pioneer who had odd doctrines. It would seem she did not follow the restoration of an Israel and the Jews. So there you have the history as I know it and experienced in that regard in the Assemblies of God. And I thank God that I was ever in the Assemblies of God. There was nothing else any better to be in in those days. And I certainly am indebted to every Assembly of God pastor I knew in some way or another, both American and Australian. As a matter of fact, it was an American Assemblies of God pastor who came to pastor our church who married me and Cecil Bonney. Because by then, to our grief, Pastor Buchanan was no longer pastor there. So we will look at the restoration of these promises in the New Testament. First of all, we think of Peter's preaching in Acts chapter 2 and also 3 and 4. He talked about Jesus Christ. He preached Jesus. First of all, he preached to the Israelites and the proselytes on the day of Pentecost after the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. He said it's a fulfillment of Joel 2 in relation to the outpouring of the Spirit. He said nothing about the judgment of Joel 2 that was to come upon Israel. But neither did he say that the Israel, you're going to be restored anyway, but in the meantime, get filled with the Holy Ghost because the restoration is, is going to come in a, in a couple of thousand years. He never said a word about that. And this is what he did say in the next chapters of Acts. He said, whom the, about Jesus Christ, whom the heavens must receive until the restoration of Israel? No. Whom the heavens must receive until the restoration of what? All things. So how can Jesus Christ ever reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years? Because the restoration of all things will not have taken place then. There's still people dying in the supposed millennium. They're getting sick and dying of old age. Sin hasn't gone. There's a battle of Armageddon to come, as some people say. And Jesus Christ is supposed to come and stand on the Mount of Olives. That alone 
is enough to convince anybody if you really think there's something wrong with that doctrine. Because Peter said, the heavens will receive Jesus until the restoration or restitution of all things. That's to do with people, that's to do with life, that's to do with animals, that's to do with birds, that's to do with this earth. And what's the restitution of all things going to consist of? Second Peter chapter 3. God is going to destroy this present order and earth and he's going to create a new heavens and a new heaven. That's the restoration. Now, how that's going to process and how quickly that will happen, we don't know. Could be instantly. How long did it take for God to create the world and, and all its greatness in creation? Only six days of 24 hours each. He decided to do it day by day. He could have done it in one day. He did it that way because he has a purpose in relation to this world that was going to fall into sin that there would be a Sabbath rest of the gospel. And the Sabbath day is a type. You read Hebrews 3 to 5 and you'll find out. In relation to the outpouring of the Spirit, that had also been promised in the rebuilding of Ezekiel's temple. Now, e Ezekiel's temple has been rebuilt in a fashion, but there is the antitype, which is the temple of the living God, and that is the redeemed in whom he dwells. And in, his, in, in the book of, of Ezekiel, chapters 40 and 41 and so forth. You see how the, the waters came out of the temple. Now the waters are a type of the Holy Ghost. And in the temple in Jerusalem when Jesus was there, in John 7, 38 and 39, he stood up and shouted to that concourse of people. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink and out from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water, just spake he of the Holy Ghost, who those that believed on him had not yet received but were to receive. It was, the temple of Ezekiel was fulfilled in the temple of the living God who, who becomes his people according to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. So the promises to Old Testament Israel were fulfilled when Jesus Christ died and rose again and became seated on the right hand of God as our high priest. And as it says in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 22 to 28. He is the high priest in heaven forever. Forever. In heaven. Forever. He cannot leave heaven once he gets there to abide anywhere else. He cannot leave heaven to live in the land of Israel. He cannot leave heaven to reign in a millennium because the word of God says he abides forever in heaven, our great high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. And you can't have an order of Melchizedek in heaven with Jesus Christ and any order according to Moses or Levi on earth at the same time. They conflict. You can only have the order of Melchizedek and we are under the order of Melchizedek today and that still exists in heaven when we get there. Jesus Christ will never leave heaven to abide. 
the only occasion on which he will leave heaven is when he comes for his saints and takes us back there. And then he will be with us there and when heaven descends to the new heavens and the new earth, there comes Jesus in the midst of his people. So Peter commenced his preaching and said nothing about a restoration of a natural Israel. Isn't that peculiar? Nowhere else in the records about Peter or in his epistles do you ever find any connection to a restoration of a natural Israel. And as a matter of fact, the first sermon that Peter gave to the Gentiles that you'd find in Acts chapter 10, he's talking about believing in Christ. He's talking about the fact that he's amazed that the Gentiles can come to Christ. So he talks about Christ in that household uh, of a Roman centurion who had soldiers under him and on them the Holy Ghost fell also. So now we look at what Paul preached about. And first of all, Acts 17, verses 30 and 31. The preaching of Paul in this particular city after he became converted was in Thessalonica. And he said these words, Although God has overlooked times of ignorance, he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has set a day on which he is going to judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he designated, having provided proof to everyone by raising him from the dead. So all the sinners out there who refuse the gospel and refuse to listen, the proof has already been established by God that he is going to bring judgment upon you. He's going to cause you to stand before his judgment seat because you've already had the news in some form of the resurrection, especially if you live in the West. The news is around. It's always been around. And so that's very important. We find in Acts chapter 15 that some men came down from Judea and began to teach. And they said, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Already, Judaism of Moses is rearing its head. What about the Judaism we have today? It is rearing its head. But it's not the Judaism of Moses. It's the Judaism of the Talmud and the Kabbalah. Those people are not following the laws of Moses. And they have deceived every one of us through leaders who get into witchcraft. As the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 3 to the Galatians, because they listened to that form of Judaism that was then in existence, you are be who has bewitched you? And we can say that to a number of Christians in our churches who are there by the scores of millions. Who has bewitched you? And that's not, not original from me. That's original from the Spirit of God who gave it to Paul. And these people were bewitched. So Paul and Barnabas had a major argument about it. But Barnabas afterwards repented. And this is what it was said by the people who were gathered at that council when they were discussing it. 
because suddenly there uh, appears this in the chapter, how that God had so blessed Paul and Barnabas later in their preaching of the gospel that even the Gentiles had come to Christ. And so this was their decision about Gentiles. Therefore I conclude that we should not cause extra difficulty for those among the Gentiles who are turning to God. You see, they realized that the gospel was good enough for Gentiles they didn't have to follow the law. But then they made an opening for those Israelites or Judeans who came to Christ to still follow law. And the church of Jerusalem did it. You see that in the writings of James. When they went to Pella, they were still following the law. They never broke free of the Judaistic practices of Moses. And today, Judaistic practices are confirmed by our evangelical and Pentecostal churches as being of God. All should read history as is recorded in the New Testament and history as re is recorded in secular history and you'll find the truth. The Apostle Paul in Philippians 1 verse 12 said, I am set for the defense of the gospel. He defended the gospel. He would allow no law, no Judaism, no following of the feasts of Israel, no circumcision, no Sabbath keeping, no rituals, no feasts at all, no Shabbat, nothing. I am set for the defense of the gospel. And as a matter of fact, he said to the Galatians, you're really under a curse. If you're bewitched, you're under a curse. Because being bewitched means you've been cursed. Scores of millions of Christians today who call themselves Christian are under the curse of being bewitched. Because whether you know it or not, that's what's ruling our world. There is no politician, no president, no prime minister, no king, no autocrat, whether secular, Roman Catholic, Orthodox, so-called Christian, Zionist, heathen, pagan, Muslim. There is not one ruler or would be ruler who is not under the power of witchcraft. They are not of God. Many of them follow masonry. Masonry is full of witchcraft, full of paganistic ways because it's to do with the Kabbalah also that is full of witchcraft. That's the kind of world we live in. No wonder James said, friendship with the world is enmity against God. You cannot be a friend of the world and a friend of God. You cannot be into those politics and s become a candidate for, uh, for a president or for a politician without being under the force of Satan's occultism and uh, being bewitched, everybody. Now you don't see that when you look at them. I've known politicians, I've spoken to them, they look all right to me, they just look human, they are human, but they have forces controlling them which they are unaware and church people who follow them as they do to a great extent in USA. You've got the Christian right. The Christian right is controlled by demons. 
the Christian right is controlled by the witchcraft of the Kabbalah. And I stand on that firmly because I've done a lot more research and read and much more. And if some of you disbelieve me, why don't you do your own research? And you'll find I'm right. Now, it's taken me a lifetime to find this out. I'm not condemning anybody. I'm just telling you the truth. Because Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. If you have any of these strange ideas, know the truth from the Word of God and you will be set free. That's the only way to be set free, to know the truth. So we like me need to be like Paul, set for the defense of the gospel. Are you? Well, by now, I am. In fact, I've been saying for years, I want truth and I want to preach truth. I will defend the truth. I've called myself a defender of the truth and I didn't know it all. I probably don't know it all yet, but I certainly know a lot more and I am set for the defense of the truth. Now we look at Acts 26, verse 16. Paul is giving defense to his majesty, who is Agrippa, King Agrippa. And this is what he says in verse 14 that he'd fallen to the ground because he'd seen a great light from heaven and he heard a voice and he'd said to him, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord replied, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Jesus then said to Paul as he related this to the king, But get up and stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you for this reason, to designate you in advance as a servant and witness to the things you have seen and to the things in which I will appear to you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a share among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. We must not be disobedient to the heavenly vision. He has stated what the heavenly vision is. The proclamation about Jesus Christ at that time to the Hebrews and to the, and to the Gentiles. That's all. What's the reason? That they all may turn from darkness to light, from Satan to God, to receive forgiveness of sins and a share of the rewards. And he never says that the rewards include a reigning with Christ from Jerusalem in a thousand years. Now, does Paul ever say that? He doesn't say it there. He doesn't say it anywhere in the whole of the New Testament. So why not do another thing? If Paul doesn't talk about it, why are our preachers talking about it? Because under the Spirit of God, Paul said, Be ye followers of me. We are not to follow Jeremiah or Isaiah or Ezekiel. We are not to follow Moses. We are not to follow David's Psalms. We are to follow Paul as he is a follower of Christ. Now, there are aspects in the Old Testament that we need to be familiar with and we need to understand it, it's the scriptures. But we are to follow Paul. Are you following Paul? 
or are you following your pastor who is following, following Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel? Because they were all fulfilled and they only prophesied until John came. Why are you following somebody who's preaching the prophecies that died out when John came? They died out. Died out, yes. They didn't exist as prophecies any longer for any people. And that means you and me.